Very good. Okay. okay, we are live on YouTube. Though I realize I can't get back to the window that I was streaming the live stream to because I have so many tabs open that I, I can't I can't get to that one. So it does take a um, minute or two. It lags a little bit, right? It's a tw it's supposed to be a twenty second lag, um, yeah. and it's pretty good. Um, yeah, so. Um, okay. People will certainly continue to, to trickle in over the next few minutes, but we can um, get started whenever you're ready. Great. Okay, so today I'm going to introduce Valeria. She's going to be our first speaker. Uh, Valeria is a senior graduate student in the lab of Dr. Weiser in the Institute of Photonic Sciences and Dr. Rupert at Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona, Spain. Her PhD project aims to understand how single cells can decode 3D shape changes in relation to their physical tissue microenvironment and accordingly regulate their cytoskeletal and cellular behavior. Today, she's going to talk about the nucleus as a mechano controller of migration plasticity. So over to you, Valeria, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot for the intro. So I'm sharing the screen. Okay. We well, can see it. A lot. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks again, Nikita, for the introduction and, well, both you girls and Adam for organizing this and giving me this chance. So I guess you are all very familiar with this movie of a uh, immune cell migrating and chasing bacteria. And I think this is the most popular video on YouTube about cell migration. And this is great, but we also know that actually cell migration in in vivo environment looks a bit more complex. So these are still neutrophils migrating in the inner ear of a zebrafish and chasing bacteria. Here, bacteria bacteria are in cyan, and the neutrophils and node plasma membranes are in orange. And as you can see, the three D environment is really complex. There are like different compartments, and these cells have to migrate through it to clean these bacteria up, and to do so they actually change a lot and really often their migration strategy. There are moments in which they do more protrusion, moments they blab, moments they have to squeeze themselves through tissue. And this happens because all physical parameters of the environment, such as the stiffness, its topology, or the confinement that the cells feel actually affect cell migration and change the migration phenotype of these cells. And what we are interested in is in particular is mechanical confinement because previous studies show that mechanical confinement alone can induce amorboid motility. So in this video, you see progenitor stem cells derived from zebrafish embryos on a 2D glass surface, just on a petri dish. And as you can see, they are non motile, but they show this small blebbing. And this is actually what they would do in the living embryo at the same stage. And strikingly, if we confine these cells, they would rapidly transform to this stable bleb phenotype and that is polarized and they start migrating around really fast and in a persistent way. And this is not specific of zebrafish, but it's actually conserved across species and many cell types do this. And in particular here, I'm showing HeLa cells confined and in non-adherent environments. This video was acquired by the PLS lab and HeLa cells can also transform to stable BLEP cells. And this process actually appears to be even more general. And just last year, there was a paper uh, published uh, showing that uh, channel flagellates, that is the closing relative um, leaving relatives to animal, can also transform to this uh, stable bleb amoeboid phenotype if they are confined. So this suggests that there is a concert mechanosensitive mechanism that allows cells to sense shape deformation and transduce this information into a motility switch. But then the main question that arises is how do cells measure shape changes. And to understand this, we use an in vitro approach based on the use of a planar microconfinement assay. And we use these glass cover slips with PDMS pillar to confine cells at a particular height in a controlled way. So if we look at our progenitor stem cells in more details and in 3D, you can see they're basically spherical, they bleb all around. Their diameter is like 20 to 25 micron. The myosin 2 is homogeneously localized in the cell. And if we confine them, in this case at 7 micrometer, first of all, you can appreciate how deformed these cells are. And also that myosin 2 motor proteins actually recruit to the cell cortex. And this is what we see. 
And in particular, we see that by lowering the confinement height, we get a continuous but nonlinear enrichment of myosin to the cortex. And this is also visible by looking at these confocal images of progenitor stem cells expressing myosin to GFP. And as pointed by these magenta arrows, you can see that the intensity of myosin to the cortex increases. Here depicted with these more yellowish, greenish pixels. And at the same time, bleb size gets bigger. And this is another consequence of the increased contractility of these cells. Importantly, this accumulation of myosin at the cortex, it's really fast after mechanical confinement is applied and then stable in time. And this tells us two things. So first of all, uh, mechanical confinement and, shape, and cell shape deformation in confinement, it's really imposing the cortical contractility set point of these cells. And this also tells us that cells are actually capable of distinguishing different confinement heights. Bleb, uh, highly contractile cells can tra spontaneously transform from the blebbing phenotype from this stable bleb migratory phenotype. And therefore we observe a higher fraction of motile cells by lowering the confinement height. And this whole process is inhibited if we treat the cell with blebistatin, giving the central law of myosin two in in this motility switch. And this tells us that in order to understand how confinement leads to this stable blood way of motility, we need to understand how actually cells activate myosin 2 when they are confined. Another important property of this mechanical response is that it's reversible. So if we release the confinement, myosin 2 uh, accumulation instantaneously drops down to the baseline level. And this together with the fact that it was stable in time, it tells us that cells are sensing shape deformation without using an elastic mechanosensor, meaning a non-dissipative one. And then another consequence of this is that it looks like if cells were equipped with like an evasion reflex mechanism that allows them to run away from confined areas. So in this bright field movies, I'm using a PDMS pillar to confine cells. So the cells in these regions are confined while the ones outside are unconfined. And as expected, only confined cells would rapidly transform to stable bleb cells and run away from the confined area. And then basically reverse their phenotype. So as I told you, uh, non-confined cells are blebbing, and this is true both for pluripotent stem cells, but also for uh, mesoderm, ectoderm, or endoderm-induced cells. So we can use this phase specification program with the zebra fish. So up until when we confine, we play them in non-adherent environment, they would always show this blebbing behavior. But if we use the mesoderm fate and then played cells on fibronectin, they would acquire a collective mesenchymal migration mode that is much slower than the amoeboid one. And strikingly, if we confine either of these samples, they would all rapidly accumulate myosin to the cortex and transform to stable bleb cells, meaning that this process is independent of sulfate on adhesion molecules or pre-existing migration phenotypes that were present in the system. So summing up what I told you, myosin to accumulation depends on the degree of the deformation, but it's fast, stable in time and reversible. So we are looking for, let's say, an elastic mechanosensing element. And I also showed you independent of sulfate and adhesions to the substrate, but also cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, transcription translation programs, caspase, stretch activated ion channels like the piezos and of the presence or not of microtubules. So I didn't show you all of this, but we, we checked for that, let's say. And one nice observation we had is that if we actually plot myosin to accumulation at the cortex, not with respect to the confinement height, but to the relative nuclear diameter that basically indicates for nuclear deformation, we could observe a biphasic behavior. So there is a first region where there is no nuclear deformation and no myosin to accumulation at the cortex, and a second region in which myosin scales linearly with nuclear deformation. And this tells us that we don't have to ask ourselves how do cells, let's say, absolutely measure confinement heights, but how the nucleus can sense physical shape deformation. And to answer this question, we uh, label the inner nuclear membrane of cells and first of all, so that in suspension cells, the inner nuclear membrane has a lot of invaginations and ruffles. And these ruffles are stretched out by lowering the confinement height. And we can quantify this by measuring the nucleus area to perimeter ratio that goes up confining the cells 
or the relative areas of this invagination that we named the invagination ratio that actually goes down by confining the sets. And this continuous unraveling basically suggests us that if we squeeze the nucleus, the inner nuclear membrane gets, goes into stretch and to tension, basically. And there was a previous study done in the field of leukocyte recruitment at the wound site in zebrafish, showing that in the cells next to the wound, there is actually a lot of swelling or lysis going on. And the, uh, the first step that then leads to leukocyte recruitment is actually nuclear mechanotransduction. And there is a lipase named cytosolic phospholipase A2 that gets activated in these cells upon inner nuclear membrane stretch. And this is the first step that then leads to the production of the chemotractant that are necessary to leukocyte recruitment. What we showed and found is that CPLA2 is actually responsible for sensing shape deformation in confinement and controlling myosin to activity. So if we treat the cells with a CPLA2 inhibitor, we completely block this myosin to enrichment at the cortex in confined cells. And as a consequence, we also drastically reduce the percentage of stable BLEP cells we observe in confinement. So this tells us that CPLA2 senses the confinement, but also controls the cellular contractility and amyloid motility. We could interfere with CPLA2 activity also using a morpholino, so a genetic approach, and we could also reduce the response that could be completely rescued by injecting a CPLA2 RNA on the morphant background, so suggesting that CPLA2 is really essential for this mechanosensing process. So CPLA2 is a lipase, and this means that it's a protein that basically cleaves lipids, and the first uh, product released by CPLA2 activity is arachidonic acid, that is a fatty acid. And we could detect it and quantify its production using Raman spectroscopy. And we could quantify arachidonic acid production upon mechanical confinement, and also show that this production is CPLA2 dependent. So by inhibiting CPLA2, we could completely block this increase. And as I told you before, this, uh, this pathway, let's say, is usually associated to inflammation response and to the production of signaling molecules. So to exclude or to check if this was also happening in our cell, we again confined cells using a PDMS pillar. So this magenta line indicates a pillar and the cells underneath are confined. And as you can see, there are several polarized cells in this region. But what we did now was to use a really high density in order to obtain pairs of cells with one cell being confined and one cell being unconfined, but in close proximity to each other. And we quantified myosin to accumulation in these pairs of cells. And we saw that myosin to accumulates only in the deformed cells, while these unconfined cells have baseline contractility levels, let's say like normal control cells. And this tells us that this CPLA2 pathway is cell autonomous. So each cell is sensing its own deformation and controlling its contractility. But then how, do, how does arachidonic acid activate myosin 2? So to check for that, we went upstream, let's say, and we looked for classical non-regulators of myosin 2 activity, and we identified Rho and ROC to be essential for this response, but not the myosin light chain kinase. So we can conclude that cells are, are capable of sensing shape deformation using CPLA2, arachidonic acid, and this is mediated by the RORO pathway, to control then my using to activity. So then we asked if the opposite was also true. So is, if inner nuclear membrane unfolding is actually sufficient to induce my using to accumulation, because this is the principle that leads to the CPLA2 mechanosensing mechanism. So we thought of hypotonic swelling to swell the cells and their nucleus to then activate the whole pathway again. And as you can see here, the inner nuclear membrane looks nicely unfolded. And as expected, we saw that myosin 2 wasn't reaching at the cell cortex, but actually to lower levels in mechanical confinement here indicated by this blue line. And this, I mean, even more strikingly, we observe almost no polarized cells. So even if the inner nuclear membrane is unfolding in the same way, this tells us that cells can realize if they're swollen or compressed. And I mean, again, considering that what CPLA2 senses is inner nuclear membrane unfolding. So to explain this, we actually observed that calcium levels are differentially regulated upon swelling or confinement. And 
In hypotonic shock in particular, we have much lower levels than under mechanical confinement. I find that CPLA2 is a calcium dependent lipase. So we first thought about uh, increasing calcium by treating the cells with ionomycin. And this was uh, really, I'm saying this way, we could really boost up both myosin to accumulation at the cortex and the fraction of polarized cells. So basically recapitulating the pathway. But then we ask ourselves, how can cells regulate their calcium differently in the two different conditions? So the most obvious thing, if we think about confined cells or swollen cells, is that in hypotonic case, the nucleus is basically embedded in a really big cell and is at the center of it. While in confinement, the nucleus is really close in, to the top and bottom plasma membrane. And actually the nucleus gets really squeezed in between these two plasma membranes. And this proximity, what we found is, is responsible to activate a double ion channel. So this is a protein complex named STEMORI complex with steam protein in the ER and ORI in the plasma membrane. And these two proteins can interact only if they can physically touch and this can happen only if the ER and the plasma membrane are in close proximity with each other. And this creates a double, basically, ion channel that can control intracellular calcium level. And this is what allows cells to distinguish in between mechanical confinement and hypotonic swelling, and then further regulate CPLA2 activity, arachidonic acid production, myosin contractility, and therefore cell behavior. So concluding, what I showed you today is that the uh, cells can sense physical shape deformation because the nucleus allows them to measure inner nuclear membrane unfolding and control myosin to activity via arachidonic acid and the rural pathway. And this furthers control migration, uh, cell migration um, and, and cell dynamics. And this is actually conserved across other cell types. So the HeLa cells I showed you before actually use the same nuclear ruler pathway to measure shape changes. And this was published in this really nice paper that was parallel to our work. And finally, I also showed you that the combination of inner nuclear membrane unfolding and nuclear positioning through the regulation of calcium levels allow cells to actually not only sense physical shape changes, but to distinguish isotropic swelling from anisotropic confinement. And this allows cells to basically feel their own shape in 3D and adapt their behavior to their local microenvironment. So with this, I conclude. I thank my, both my supervisors, Veren and Stefan, all the lab members and collaborators, and you for the attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Valeria. Um, I think we have questions trickling down. So Amanda wants to ask, have you tried depleting AA or omega-6 precursors? So depleting arachidonic acid itself. So we blocked CPLA2 activity only, but we did not find really a way to completely deplete arachidonic acid. And the other way, the other thing, sorry, omega. I omega six precursors. No, never done. <laughs> so while we wait for other questions, I have a question myself. So it looks like ER is one of the major players for regulating the calcium levels, right? So uh, do you think uh, first in, uh, in the confined cells, there is ER also releasing CPLA2? Because I remember in the paper, there was experiment about removing the nucleus and then crushing the cells. And then the second question is in the stable blebs, where do you think the ER is? And is it really releasing like calcium to those large blebs or not? So we also tried removing the nucleus. It didn't really work with the zebrafish. What we did was to use mitotic cells, basically. I know it's really different, but you can still stack cells in mitosis. And this also, I mean, then without nucleus, the cells are not capable. It's known that if not in the nucleus, uh, CPLA2 can be actually active both in the ER and in the Golgi if needed. But oh, this wow. is okay. reported less, uh, let's say less time, and we never saw accumulation in the ER. So our CPLA2, even when not active, is in the nucleus. So even if the name says satosolic. So this is the first yeah, different and doubt that I have about literature, but it's already in the nucleus. And then sometimes it goes to the inner nuclear membrane. So I'm not sure whether it's really active in the ER. Okay. And I'm not even sure how I could prove that. 
And in the stable blep, I know they are, it's, I mean, I saw it, it's mainly at the back, but it also mm -hmm. flows towards the front. So there are these two opposite movements of things being pushed towards the front with the cytosol and things going backwards. So it would be really nice to know if this can move arachidonic acid or how is arachidonic acid localizing or yeah, all of these, but I don't have, unfortunately, any <laughs> clue. Thank you so much. Great. Um, our next question is from Felix Campello. Uh, says, um, can you rescue the CPLA2 inhibition by adding arachidonic acid? Do you think so, that the, oh, go ahead. Uh, you can answer that one first. Here's the second okay. two. Okay. So we added it and we can activate myosin too, but not a lot in the sense that we, yeah, it's not comparable with, for example, LPA, that is a really selective activator of the rope pathway. And this really allows us to polarize the cells. So arachidonic acid is not so strong. I don't know if this is an experimental issue because it's a fatty acid and maybe, I don't know. Okay, great. Okay. And the second, the second question um, from Felix, do you think that the lysolipids might also be uh, playing a role in the mechanosensing? Yeah, I mean, uh, so as I said, the uh, LPA, that is lysophosphatidic acid, activates myosin. And yeah, I mean, once CPLA2 is active, it generates arachidonic acid, but also the lysophospholipids at the same time, because it's like the other part remaining from the lipid. And so they are involved for sure, because I mean, they're generated and we know the LPA story, but yeah. I don't know anything more. It's really hard to work with lipid. I mean, or you do lipidomics or to see them. It's really hard. So with Raman, we could actually, but I mean, luckily it's arachidonic. So this was already something, but yeah, I'm really happy to get suggestions for methods if someone has. Great. Uh, uh, the other question is from uh, Gao Zhu. Uh, says nice presentation. Uh, have you examined the surface of nucleus outer and the inner membrane to see if there is a rupture under seven micron confinement? So normally we don't see ruptures. So, I mean, we can see the outer nuclear membrane with ER trackers basically, and the inner usually look stable. And we also express nuclear GFP to see if there was yeah, these GFP flashes, but normally it stays entire. We don't see excess, I don't know, nuclear blending actually is the opposite, it's really intention and it stays. But I mean, I also have to say this, uh, progenitor stem cells have a slightly different nuclear mechanics and nuclear envelope compositions and like HeLa cells. So maybe this is also why behaviors are different. Great, uh, Denner, do you wanna um, unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thanks Jennifer. Valeria, very nice talk. Uh, so, my question is, uh, so uh, your membrane blebbing is confined to actively, uh, uh, cells actively undergoing mitosis, right? So coming to uh, pluripotent stem cells, which are sometimes quiescent, for example, take the examples of uh, adult stem cells, which are also confined to a very specific niche, but are quiescent and, and that is not undergoing active mitosis. So in that case, uh, how does this uh, the system of arachidonic acid play a role in the in quiescent state and at the time of injury when these how these cells become active to undergo blebbing and undergo migration? Can you uh, elaborate on that? Uh, so I'm sorry if I understood everything. So our cells are not blebbing just after mitosis; they always bleb no matter what. So in the living embryos, these stem cells already bleb, even if you don't do anything, like in the breast state. So, so you mean to say that like a quiescent stem cell in its niche undergoes blebbing, active blebbing? Yeah, so this is really the first four hours after zebrafish was, the embryo was fertilized. And at this stage, uh -huh. if you look inside the embryo, these cells do bleb. So this is not okay. related to anything else. So, so now I'm confused. So and then the stable blep is what we use with the confinement. So what's the significance of this blebbing? So because it doesn't move from its move out of its niche. So what is the significance for the cells to undergo blebbing in that scenario? Yeah, I don't know. This is a big question. I don't know why these cells already bleb, 
But I also have to say, it's not like a niche, like if you have a tissue and you have a really constricted niche in which you have stem cells, but it's the whole cell cap. They are all identical stem cells. So, you know, it, it, it's different that yes, basically half of the embryo is yolk and the other half is cell that are all identical and they're all blebbing. And then after a couple of hours, you start to get the different tissues mm -hmm. and then some tissues migrate, some stays a bit blebbing. And then, but it's still everything really loose. There is a lot of fluid in between. Uh -huh. So it's not like an adult tissue in which things are really compact and there are really strong junctions. These cells are more like floating around. Ah, okay. All right. Thanks. I can show you a movie of the embryo if you want. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks because a lot. It's really different. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Danor and Valeria. Um, so there is a compliment from Marina saying inspiring work and keep on squeezing. And I'll take another question from Hamid. Is the reversibility of myosin accumulation linked to the elastic behavior of the nucleus? Yes. So, I mean, the nucleus is reported to be the stiffest and the most elastic organelle, let's say, that's inside the cell, of course, is still viscoelastic. And we actually measure this and it's, yeah, it behaves like a viscoelastic materials and it stores some energy if you deform it. So, this tells you that it really keeps the energy like an elastic material. And this actually viscoelastic properties do not change with the confinement. So it's not like the nucleus dissipates everything because it's confined, but it stays elastic in the same way. And we believe that this is what allows it to, to be reversible. I mean, for the process to be reversible, but yeah. All right, fantastic. Uh, from Anna Passapera, did you look at microtubules to see if they depolymerize under confinement, releasing GFH1 inducing myosin 2 activation? So we looked at it and we don't see any change in the microtubules. I mean, they look okay. I cannot say if they are like slightly depolymerized, but they're entire and they're there. So I don't think this is enough. And then we did the opposite, we depolymerize them in suspension, but we do not see an increase of myosin too. So only depolymerizing them is not enough to really control contractility at this, saying these levels. Okay, so there is a question and a suggestion. Uh, your data suggests that the rho and the myosin activity are upstream of CPLA2, uh, but the, you do not test the role of actin and why is that? Uh, this would be interesting as calcium affects the actin cytoskeletal in several ways and impact both on cell cortex and nucleus. So yeah, really nice question. So we quantified actin accumulation, but it doesn't change by further confining the cells. So I know what matters is the myosin to actin ratio, but yeah, actin does not change. And what we also did, um, so we tried to depolymerize the actin and then check for CPLA2 activity and it's unaffected and the glucose unfolds in the same way. I didn't check calcium actually, so I cannot answer about that, uh, but it looks like this is upstream of actin, let's say. So, I mean, I can get myosin activation without having the actin there. Of course, I will not build a stable myosin cortex because there is no actin to bind on, but it works. Okay, great. Uh, from Marta Urbanska, did you measure the properties of the nucleus while inside the cells? And how can you be sure that the nucleus is actually stiffer and you're not measuring the contribution of the cytoskeletal network around the nucleus? Yes, so actually this is a yeah, really nice question, really cool. So we did actually optical tweezers inside the cell. So this is super nice because I can inject beads in the one cell stage embryo. So we're basically just after fertilization, there is only one cell and I inject micro beads there, like one micrometer polyesterine beads, and then the cells keep dividing. And then I get beads inside the pluripotent stem cells. Then I dissociate the embryos. And then we did optical tweezers by trapping these cells, these beads that are inside the cells and then indenting the nucleus. So there is no contribution for the outside cortex. We can still do the usual controls like depolymerizing it, but we are doing it from the inside. So we can really compare the nucleus to the cytosol. So this is really cool. And yeah, thanks to our collaborators, let's say. And we just uh, published the protocol in Jove, if you're interested, or I can send the link out. Thank you so much, Valeria. I think that's it with the questions. Jen, are we missing something in YouTube? No, right. 
No, I don't think um, don't think we have any there. So uh, with that, thank okay. you so Thanks much, Gloria. For the, yeah, that was really fantastic. I remember when your paper and Alexis's paper came out in parallel <laughs> um, a little while back. It was it was yeah, really amazing. Like a year ago already. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. We will move on to our second talk of the hour. So we welcome uh, Paolo Armando Gagliardi. He is a senior postdoc in the Olivier Pertz lab at the University of Bern. Um, and he is there studying the connection among single cell signaling dynamics, fate decision and tissue homeostasis. Paolo graduated from the University of Torino, and he also worked at the Candiolo Cancer Institute uh, for his PhD studies and then his first postdoc. And with that, I will hand it over to Paolo and uh, take it away. Thanks. Okay. So um, thanks a lot, Jennifer, for the introduction. And uh, today I'm here to present uh, my story, my result about uh, uh, signaling waves. So it is uh, not strictly about cell migration, but I would say uh, about a related topic. And specifically, what I'm going to talk is the role of uh, signaling waves in the control of EPTL homeostasis. Uh, first, I want to start with the similitude because when uh, I was preparing this presentation, I realized that uh, these waves uh, remember a game that I think all of you were used to do when you were kids. And this game in Italian is called uh, Telefono Senza Fili, in English, Chinese Whisper. And uh, the mechanism is really simple because a person has to tell uh, something to a second person that has to repeat the same message to the third and so on. And the funny part of this game is that uh, the information gets corrupted very quickly. And this happens because each person has to uh, encode a message into words that have to be received and decoded by a second person that in turn has to encode the same information and every error gets accumulated. Well, uh, recently we started to know that also cells are able to uh, play this game uh, in those that we call the signaling waves. Here you see an example that is by the way is connected to cell migration because uh, these cells produce signaling wave, waves while closing a wound. So during the wound healing process, another beautiful example is the um, are the waves during the regeneration of uh, scales in a fish, and both these examples uh, are uh, are based on the pathway of uh, map kinase ERK, and this pathway is quite uh, well known because it's the major transducer of uh, signal from growth factors that bind to tyrosine kinase receptor and activate this cascade of signals. Um, the reason why we are observing waves of this pathway is be because we have at our disposal um, very good biosensor for ERK activity. Uh, the pathway of ERK is also important in the recent years because we started to know how much the dynamics of this pathway is important for many behavior of cells. So we realized that cells are not only able to produce a complex dynamics over time. This is a single cell trajectory, by the way. Uh, but also they are able to interpret these dynamics and to use this information to take decisions about the cell fate. Um, for instance, they can decide about cell cycle, uh, cell death or differentiation, but also they can use this information content to uh, self-organize and to uh, show emergent properties such as uh, tissue homeostasis, morphogenesis or development. The way how in the first lab we are studying the signaling dynamics and the signaling waves is by using a bit broader approach. So we are not studying the pathway of ERK alone, but also in parallel with the pathway of AKT. Uh, this because there is also a biosensor for AKT. Uh, actually, both the biosensor that we use for ERK and AKT work in a similar way. Uh, they're called the kinase translocation reporters because they translocate from the nucleus to the cytosol upon phosphorylation. Uh, for, AKT, for ERK, it is a peptide that um, when phosphorylated goes out from the nucleus and it is fused with the fluorescent protein m 2 uh, For AKT, we use uh, a portion of its natural substrate, FOXO3A, that does exactly the same thing. So by simply measuring the fluorescence 
um, the ratio of the fluorescence between the cytosol and the nucleus, we have a direct measurement of the activity in real time in each single cell. As a model of study, we use the MCFTNA cells that are of mammary origin. This is a well-established model of uh, EPTL cells in vitro. Uh, we introduce the two biosensors plus the nuclear marker that is used for uh, image analysis. And uh, over the years, we developed a um, um, set of uh, Im image analysis tools. Um, so we use the nuclear marker to uh, segment and track the cells. And then we produce uh, data that we can represent as uh, color-coded maps in which we have a view on the heterogeneity of a signal in uh, the cells in our population, in our field of view. But also we can represent the dynamics as signaling trajectories in which we have an overview on how the signaling is changing over time in uh, each single cell in our population. And we can represent that as uh, curves or uh, heat maps. With these tools, uh, we notice the very curious phenomenon. And this phenomenon is that when, uh, whenever there is an apoptotic event, uh, this event was triggering a wave of ERK and AKT activity in the neighbors. To understand uh, the propagation of these waves, we classify the neighbors according to their topology in relation to the apoptotic cell. So we identify cells that are the direct neighbors, a second layer, and so on. Uh, we order the cells according to uh, this topological classification. And what we found is that uh, the cells that are in direct contact with the apoptotic one are the first to be activated. Then they communicate this activation to the second layer and to the third layer and so on. And while this communication is happening, less and less cells get activated, so the information gets lost. Uh, this is very well visible for ERK, a bit less for the activity of AKT, because we learned during the years that uh, the activity of AKT is uh, more heterogeneous, so it's more difficult to, to see uh, this kind of waves in this representation. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time into understanding uh, the feature of these waves. So uh, first, we wanted to understand when this wave is occurring. So to do so, we annotated different phases of the execution of apoptosis, phases that we could see in our movies, starting from nuclear shrinkage to apoptotic bodies. And then we superimposed the activity of ERK in the direct neighbors. You can see that the activity starts immediately as, as soon as we see the first morphological pieces of evidence of apoptosis, indicating it is a quite early phenomenon, absolutely preceding the um, later stages of apoptosis. Also, we did uh, some experiment to understand the mechanism of propagation. And what we found is summarizing this cartoon. We found that the apoptotic cell is able to activate metalloproteases that cleave proligand of EGFR that bind to EGFR on the neighboring cell that in turn activates AKT and ERK pathways. And this is consistent with the other reports in which they characterize the signaling waves of ERK in other contexts. Um, but as I said you before, the, um, we are not only interested in um, exploring the waves by themselves, but also uh, to understand the functional consequence for uh, fate decisions of these uh, waves, these signaling dynamics. Uh, we hypothesized that the wave generated by the apoptotic cell could regulate the survival of neighboring cells. To understand if it is, was the case, we collected events of primary uh, apoptosis followed by a certain period of time by secondary apoptotic events in the direct neighbors. And then we annotated in if these uh, direct neighbors were triggered or not to produce the wave of her activity. Uh, by calculating the proportion of cells that were activated, uh, we obtained this uh, dashed line that is our reference. But then we calculated the same proportion only in the cells that were dying as a secondary apoptotic event. And what we noticed is that in uh, the interval between zero and two hours, there was a shift in this proportion. And precisely the class of uh, cells that were showing a pulse of activity and then dying by apoptosis was decreased compared to the other class. This demonstrates that uh, receiving a wave of activity 
is a pro-survival factor for the neighboring cells. But we wanted to uh, investigate that better. So what we did was to annotate uh, many more events of apoptosis, and then we associated these uh, apoptotic events to their past signaling history over several hours preceding the apoptotic event. And then we compared these trajectories with trajectories of cells that were not committed to apoptosis. Um, so we did this analysis, and thanks to the help of two uh, talented computational biologists in our lab, Marc Antoine and Mace, um, what Mark did was to use a convolution neural network approach to separate the trajectories from apoptotic versus non-apoptotic cells. And the neural network learned to do that really well. So there are two separate populations. And when Mark um, asked the neural network, which are the trajectories that are most prototypical for the two classes, the result was that apoptotic trajectories are typically flat, whereas non-apoptotic trajectories are characterized by many pulses of activity. Mace used the complementary approach he developed a method to automatically identify collective events and then to associate these collective events to the signaling history of cells. And there are, they are here represented as um, horizontal orange lines. And despite these events are pretty common in our epithelium, uh, the chance of observing them in the history of cells that were dying at the end of these trajectories is quite low because most of the tra these trajectories are completely devoided of qualitative events in their past. So these two analyses together uh, further confirm us that uh, um, for a cell receiving a wave of activity due to enabling apoptotic events, but maybe also due to other events, is a factor that promotes the survival. Uh, on the contrary, if this cell don't see pulses of activity because there are no neighboring apoptotic events, the chance of this cell of dying is superior. Um, the, we wanted also to characterize well the time of uh, survival induced by pulses of ERK and AKT. To do so, we used an orthogonal approach. Um, we used the optogenetics. And um, luckily, in our lab, Coralie spent quite a bit of time to combine an optogenetic actuator OptoFGFR together with the biosensor of ERK. Uh, this optogenetic actuator is made by the kinase domain of uh, the receptor for FGF combined with CRY2 that dimerizes with blue light, activating the pathway of ERK and AKT. And then in the same cell, we have the biosensor for ERK, this time fused with another fluorescent protein to be spectrally compatible with the um, optogenetic actuator. With this system, you can generate pulses of activity that uh, resemble the pulse that we see in the neighbors of apoptotic cells. And we can do experiments in which we stimulate in a synchronous and homogeneous way all the cells in the field of view. So having this tool in our end, we decided to do one experiment in which we pulsed the cells with uh, mm, different frequencies. Uh, here on the left, this number represents the time that separates two consecutive pulses. Um, and we uh, simply by varying this time, we generate the different frequencies and we compare the frequencies with the no pulsing at all. Uh, this is the experiment. So here there are different frequency of pulsing. And in the same experiment, we annotated the apoptotic event. I hope that you can uh, appreciate from the movie that when we pulse every one, two or three hours, there are less apoptotic events compared when we pulse at lower frequency or when we don't pass at all. Um, for the quantification, the uh, result is even more understandable. And also the quantification tells us that uh, it doesn't matter much if we pulse every one, two or three hours, because in all the cases we get the same survival phenotype. And this is another demonstration that each single pulse of her activity by a survival time of about three, four hours. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to understand is uh, the connection between uh, this uh, survival mechanism medi mediated by the waves of ERK and AKT for epithelial homeostasis. 
To understand that, we challenged the epithelium with a drug able to, to induce a higher rate of apoptosis. We used doxorubicin, and at the beginning of the treatment, there is not much happening, but then suddenly the apoptotic rate increases. And when there is a high apoptotic rate, also the activity of uh, ERK is high. Uh, this makes sense because each apoptotic cell produces a wave of ERK, and many waves activate most of the epithelium. Uh, this is visible also from the quantification. So at a certain point, we have a rapid increase of the apoptotic rate, and we see the same for the activity of ERK and AKT. But then at a certain point, something interesting happens because the apoptotic rate at about 2% uh, stops its increase and it gets stable over time at, a, at about 3% for many hours. And the same, it is happening for the activity of ERK and AKT. So which is the source of this steady state phase? Well, it is again our survival mechanism because each cell, is, each apoptotic cell, is able to induce an area around the apoptotic site in which cells are protected from apoptosis for about three, four hours. This limits the area that in which uh, apoptosis can occur in the hours after the previous apoptotic events. And this generates a protection feedback mechanism that maintains steady the apoptotic rate. The demonstration that this is the case uh, comes by the inhibition of the communication between the apoptotic cell and the neighbors. Indeed, we can inhibit uh, metalloproteases, EGFR, AKT, MAC, and in all the cases, the steady state phase is compromised and the apoptotic rate increases to higher level to 6% or even more per hour. Uh, the reason of that is the lack of communication between the apoptotic cell and the neighbors that cannot generate the area of survival around the apoptotic site and many more apoptotic events occur. The functional consequence for the epithelium is that it cannot withstand anymore with a too high apoptotic rate. And suddenly we have the formation of uh, multiple holes in the epithelium. The, it is uh, the demonstration of uh, the loss of the epithelial barrier. And this happens for all the inhibitors that we tested and um, happens only minimally and very late for the condition in which um, we don't put uh, the inhibitor, just uh, the MSO control. Uh, it turns out that uh, our discovery is not a peculiarity of our in vitro system, because at the same time, the group of uh, Romain Lavalle in Paris found that the same mechanism occurs in uh, Drosophila. Indeed, again, an apoptotic cell induces the activation of FERC in the neighbors that uh, are protected from apoptosis for a certain time. And uh, this mechanism uses the same molecular pathway that involve EGFR. We had the luck to publish our discovery with them uh, back to back in the same number of the cell. And uh, this suggests that uh, this mechanism might be uh, so important for animal life that we can find the same in two animals that are separated by evolution for more than half a billion of years. Um, so, um, to sum up what I, I told so far, uh, we found a communication mechanism by which the apoptotic cell induces the activation of ERK and AKT into the neighbors that in turn acquire a survival phenotype that uh, is important for the maintenance of epithelial homeostasis. But this is not the only role of uh, signaling waves that we are exploring in our lab. Because uh, what we found is that uh, waves occur also during morphogenesis of uh, asina in vitro. Indeed, when we take uh, the MCFTNA model, we culture them in matrigel, they reproduce the morphogenetic program of the mammary gland. So first starting from a field structure that then cavitates by apoptosis of inner cells. What Pascal found in our lab is that uh, uh, during this morphogenetic program, um, and multiple waves of ERK activity occur. And this wave, interestingly, uh, occur mostly in the outer layer and rarely penetrate inside. And this correlates with the survival of outer cells and death of inner cells, contributing to the formation of the lumen. 
Uh, what we are currently doing in the Pers Lab is to keep exploring these waves. We are spend uh, some energies into uh, developing our method to automatically identify collective events, and we baptize this method Arcos. We are currently preparing the manuscript, but also we want to understand how the signaling waves are involved in cancer. And for instance, when uh, we put the Peter kinase mutation in uh, MCFTNA cells, uh, we observe more waves of her captivity, and uh, and also these waves penetrate more inside, and this and this wave correlate with the lack of formation of the lumen. Uh, I want to show you also some other example of signaling waves that we observe. He, these are MDCK and RK, both are renal cells, and both show collective waves of ERK activity in response uh, to uh, an apoptotic event in the center. Uh, ERK and DKT are not the only messengers able to um, um, produce waves. This is an example coming from another lab in which also they observed the calcium waves uh, originating from an apoptotic event. And also I like to show this example. Uh, this is a completely different thing. We are talking about a superorganism. This is a nest of human and beast that uh, flip their abdomen in a reaction to a predator. So these are all examples of waves. And uh, this example tell us that these events are pretty common in nature. We as just started to, to observe them, but this arises the hypothesis that this event can be a universal mechanism to uh, deliver information in a large community of uh, individuals. Um, we are very far from understanding the, the language of this communication. There are still many open questions. Here are just a few that uh, came into my mind, such as uh, we don't know how accurate is the communication, what determines the speed, or define the size of the waves or if there are many uh, other pathways involved. Of course, this depends on the future development of uh, biosensor of other pathways. And uh, with that, I conclude uh, this presentation. I want to thank all the members of the PETS lab here uh, uh, portrayed uh, during our last uh, hike in the Swiss Alps, uh, our collaborators and our funding agencies. And uh, of course, of all of you for the attention. I'm here for any questions. Awesome, fantastic. Um, so while we wait for some folks to, to um, add questions to the chat, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on how the cells are distinguishing between um, a neighbor apoptosing uh, versus just a neighbor pulling on them as, as the group would be you know, during collective migration. Uh, well, uh, there must be some some overlap for the signals that the, the cells are experiencing well, in these two cases. What what we are learning from uh, the MCF10 model is that uh, they always produce pulses of the, the same size. So probably they cannot distinguish that. So because what 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 each cell is seeing is a pulse of activity. So what, what cell can see is actually how many pulses. Uh, they they receive or they are triggered to produce. So just they are just uh, counting the pulses in a certain way. So they cannot distinguish if they are coming from a neighboring apoptotic event, from uh, uh, wound healing. Um, so what they see is just a pulse. So uh, we can see the waves as emergent properties because we are external observers, right? We can see the epithelium from the top, but for a single cell that is an epithelium. The only point of view is just uh, the dynamics, so just pulses. Yeah. Absolutely right, right. They don't know what's, what's. this is how they know how what's going on further away. Um, and so, sorry, just a, a follow-up, you know, you, you showed the pulses. What happens when you, instead of changing frequency, you change duration um, of the pulses? Does that matter? Yes, yes, absolutely. This, um, uh, this is an important thing because um, uh, depending on the, on the phenomenon for us, our, our, our phenomenon was uh, survival. Um, in that phenomenon, we found that uh, frequency is the thing that matters. Uh, because during uh, the, the paper about spheroid, we got asked by a reviewer to test uh, the, if there is a, 
uh, modulation of frequency or amplitude of, uh, of the pulses. So what we did, we use optogenetics to produce pulses that were larger. Uh, but we, we decrease the frequency to keep the same area under the curve. And cells can distinguish between uh, uh, more frequent pulses and less frequent pulses, despite their area under the curve is the same. So, yeah. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Paolo. Uh, next question is from Metello Innocenti. How general is the role of MMP-mediated cleavage of the EGFR ligand in the survival mechanism that you outlined? Uh, as far as uh, remembers, MMP inhibitors failed in the clinic and MMP knockout mice are okay. Do you envis envision alternative mechanisms for this? Hmm. Uh, that is a, well, this is a good point. Yeah, and on our system, uh, when we block metalloprothesis, we absolutely block uh, the propagation of the waves. Uh, I have to say that what we are seeing is uh, uh, the activity of FERC. So we are seeing, uh, let's say, uh, our point of view is the, is the activity of FERC. But it could be that the apoptotic cells also send other messages. Uh, actually, it's quite uh, quite. I would say obvious that apoptotic cell can send different messages than the um, growth factors that bind to HFR, but we simply cannot see them because we are looking only to the activity of work. So probably yes, there are other mechanism of communication that maybe will be discovered in the future with other biosensors. I guess. Right, great. Uh, from Agata Naiga, have you tried ablating cells and checking for ERK or AKT activity? Um, she wonders how much of the of this is due to the MMP cleavage or just loss of cell cell adhesion. Uh, sorry, have you tried to? Uh, uh, ablate, make... ablate cells and then check for the ERK uh, or AKT activity to distinguish between the MMP cleavage versus loss of cell cell adhesion. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, no, no, we, we didn't test that, no. So we don't know if, um, uh, I mean, also adhesions are involved, yeah. Uh, the only thing that we did, but it's a different experiment with the microfluidic experiments to, uh, uh, to flush out the medium to exclude the diffusion. But, uh, but we, we, uh, we didn't do an experiment in which we, we removed the, the cell cell adhesions. Thank you, Paolo. Um, next question is from Cornelia Schreuer. Do you actually know what is downstream of ERG that affects the survival in your system? And as you mentioned in your last slide, it is interesting to think of the length scale of the wave. Are you aware of any cell inhibitory loops? Mm. Um, so, okay, about survival. Yeah, so as I show you, the, the survival is about three, four hours in our system. Uh, whereas the pulse of work is about uh, 30 minutes. So um, the survival cannot be explained by simply phosphorylation of some mediator of a downstream effector of work and AKT, but it is something longer. So we, we don't have an answer, uh, but uh, this is uh, quite compatible with the transcript transcriptional response that uh, people are studying that quite well for the patio of work. So this is a more or less the timing that the uh, transcription response can, uh, can occur. So we think that. Um, the second question well, okay, was about the size of the waves. Um, well, actually, yes, this is a very cool question. Um, what we see is that uh, when we compare the multiple layers of cells is that uh, somehow the wave loses efficiency uh, and some cells simply don't get activated. So we don't know why. Also, we see that uh, in uh, multiple models, uh, the waves have different sizes. In MDCK, the waves are really huge and propagate from a lot of layers. Also, we lose them. We cannot distinguish if they're coming from uh, one apoptotic event or another. Uh, so we don't know what is uh, uh, determining the different efficiency in propagation among cell lines. So do you think there are any self-inhibitory loops in there? That was sort of the last part. Yeah, I don't know if it is. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be um, some uh, some inhibitory loop, but more a, 
a, a, almost a binary decision. So a cell can get activated or not. So the reason why some cells stop sensing the neighbor, uh, we don't know. Thank you. Great. Um, so we have two questions from Sang Yun Han, and I'll ask them separately. First, do you think there's any way to enhance the wave decaying rate? To enhance the wave de decaying rate? You mean the, um, uh, the, the again about the size of the wave? Uh, is that the question? Uh, I guess, or you know, what 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 could you do to to alter to modify the, well, the wave well, this propagation? Is, this, is this is a very interesting question. Because uh, when, when I used all these inhibitors that I showed you before, we simply completely abrogate the wave, right? Because we, we completely block the communication between the apoptotic cell and the neighbors. Uh, so it's very difficult to disentangle the, the communication between the apoptotic and the direct neighbors and between the first neighbor and the second neighbor and so on. So we, we haven't found we haven't found anything that can block, for instance, only the, the communication between uh, the neighbors and not between the apoptotic and the first neighbors. So uh, what we can do at the moment uh, with the tools that we know is just to abrogate completely the waves, right? Not to modulate them. Okay, and it, as a, a follow-up to that, um, Sang Yun says uh, that you've beautifully quantified the apoptosis events and the AKT signaling. And have you uh, done any analysis of the time series to find a functional causality between those? Um, yes, actually, uh, yes, because of what I didn't say during this study phase is that uh, uh, since it is a feedback mechanism, so the apopto apoptosis induces the activity of ERK and AKT that induces survival, so this limits the apoptosis. This is expected to induce oscillations, right? And indeed, this, it is what we observed. We, we observed in our, also when we did other experiments, there are oscillations because there, there are moments in which uh, there is a, mm, more apoptosis induces more waves, so this suppresses uh, much more the, the, the apoptosis, but then this catch up a bit. So we have oscillation. The thing is that these oscillations are never too clear because uh, of course uh, these events are not uh, well synchronized. Maybe the duration of this survival phenotype is not precise. So these kind of oscillations are dampening very quickly and we lose them uh, quite soon. But already in the, in the chart that I showed before, there is a, a, a small oscillation. They are typical of the feedback uh, phenomena. Yeah. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, next question is from Anna Pasapera. You sort of answered the first part where she's asking about do the dynamics of waves depend on cell cell adhesion? Um, but the second part of the question is what happens if the cells undergo EMT by treating the cells with TGF beta, maybe to, with ERG being active in the system? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, no, no, we didn't do any experiment uh, in cells that were not uh, epithelial, so we, we don't have an answer. Yeah. Thank you. All right, great. Um, the next question is from uh, Yutaka, if you'd like to unmute yourself. <clears throat> Hello, thank you very much. Uh, great talk. I I have a, uh, before main question, uh, can I uh, do one short confirmation? Uh, I don't remember time scale, but your wave uh, propagates within one minute or two minutes very quickly, right? Uh, well, actually, I would say a single wave uh, event can last for one hour, about. Uh, of course, uh, the, for each, uh, uh, yes, for each cell, it can the, last 20 minutes, but then, uh, I mean, the first cells are activated at the beginning, oh. then the others later. Yeah. I, I see. Thanks. And uh, the, uh, Jennifer and Agatha asked about uh, collective migration and uh, scratch wound healing. And long ago, we uh, observed the uh, arc waves in uh, scratch wound healing of MDCK cell sheet. And there are two different waves, a uh, very quick one uh, propagating in within minutes and uh, soon decreases. And then the other one is gradually, gradually uh, uh, <coughs> propagates uh, within hours. And uh, I wanted to uh, ask whether one of two, uh, these two waves are similar to yours. 
and uh, they are they have different uh, sensitivity to pharmacological inhibition. So have you tried uh, actin inhibitor? If you put cytokalasin or any actin inhibitor, is the wave uh, change? Hmm. No, actually, I never we never tried that. Well, what we tried is uh, to use bistatin, mm -hmm. and uh, this is not uh, uh, abrogating the waves because they still occur more or less in the same way. I see. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the duration, uh, I mean, the, the communication seemed quite slow mm. because I, I measure more or less the timing of communication between the first and the second layer mm. and the, the second to the third. And this happens in the order of uh, oh, minutes, let's say five, ten minutes for oh. each, uh, each layer. Huh? But it's uh, correlated with calcium wave. Isn't calcium wave very quick? Yes, yes. And yeah, the, 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 this is a good, the interesting thing because... Uh, the, these waves happen at a completely different time scale. Mm. So the, the, there is a, a wave of calcium that happens in the order of seconds. Oh, I see. Mm. And then a slow wave of ERK. So it's, it is interesting because for the cells that are uh, the direct neighbors, of course, these waves happen very close in time. But for cells that are far, there is mm. a quite a yeah. long interval yeah. between the two. That's another so, question I wanted to, yeah. Uh, I wondered whether there are two different signals which is propagated very quickly and then slowly, slowly, uh, and uh, they are combined and uh, send some different information. Yeah, 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 no, I, it is curious. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, because we focus more on the survival response, but of course, these waves also coordinate uh, cytoskeleton migration. Maybe the closure of the mm. the wound or the extrusion uh, as well. So yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry to spend too much time. No, no, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is from Li Chang, Jessica Chiu. Um, wondering if ERK pulsing generates some sort of memory in the neighboring cells. So perhaps the extent and the periodicity of the ERK pulses required for cells to survive decreases. Mm, okay. This is also another interesting point. Uh, I mean, they seem to have a bit of memory for some hours. Uh, because when we did these two computational analysis uh, with the neural network, it seems that also the hours before can count, right? But it, from what we see is uh, the period of four hours before uh, apoptosis that, that is more important. Because uh, if, if uh, for four hours there is no, 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 so no pulse, the chance of dying is higher. But it seems that also the time before can count, at least partially. But we 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 haven't investigated that uh, further. So um, one more question: um, uh, Is the cell cell contact actually required for the waves to occur, or can the waves occur without cell cell contact, cell cell adhesion? Yeah, well, uh, after this is an experiment that uh, I wanted to do, but uh, to to see for instance if the signal can uh, can overcome a small gap. But uh, with the this line is so difficult to do because uh, they allow so much to stay in clumps, so it's almost impossible to keep them physically separated unless of building like a micro patterning with maybe a small gap to see if the wave can uh, jump over the gap. So mm. yeah. what if but you just there... like chelated calcium or knocked out? I mean, mm. I don't know if you can yeah. knock out all adhesions, but you could knock out yeah. e yeah. here in. Yeah. This is a good suggestion. Yeah. Oh, one more uh, just came in uh, from Shilpasant. Is there any relation between the signaling wave and the directionality when the cells are collectively moving? Mm. Which you didn't show here, but I'm sure you look at too. Uh, well, uh, the thing is that uh, um, there is a, at least during the, the closure of, of the gap during the extrusion, uh, there is the, a contractile phase that is quite fast and happens in a reaction to the activation of caspases in the, the apoptotic cell. 
that pulls uh, the neighbors. And you can see this, this movement toward the, the center. But this movement is faster than the wave, the wave that we see. It's, the wave that we see is quite slow and, uh, of, co of course, later. Uh, but it could be still some uh, some movement toward the center, but uh, we didn't investigate that. So, but uh, it's, it's slower than the uh, this fast contraction due to uh, activation of caspases in the apoptotic cell that we see in the movies. I have a question, if I can. Um... What happens really upstream of ERK signaling? Because you're talking about RTKs. Do you think there's some sort of wave that is generated there? Like, how, how does that work? Because somehow I can't picture how this, you know, upstream of all that, where there's ligand and receptors on the plasma membrane is generating these waves. And I've always been curious about this. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, of course, we are still missing some piece of information because... For sure, we know that these uh, the, 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 these waves are completely dependent on EGFR. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that EGFR is activated in the consequence of uh, the activation of metalloproteases. Uh, we still don't know how this uh, activation of EGFR, then the pathways downstream, lead to the activation of metalloproteases to activate the next cell. So this mm -hmm. piece of information is missing. Also, we don't know how the apoptotic cell activates metalloproteases because I look through papers, and this is quite unclear. In the past, uh, someone thought that uh, metalloproteases are activated as a consequence of uh, uh, the permeabilization of mitochondria and that release uh, um, ROS species. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, actually, we don't know. So we just know that uh, this RLA of communication depends on metalloproteases, EGFR, and then the cells activate again metalloproteases, we suppose, but we don't know how. So if it is also a, a mechanical communication, because we know that uh, downstream ERK and AKT, there is uh, also the activation of the cytoskeleton, maybe. Mm. But we, we, we don't know. Thank you. Okay, I think we got everybody. Thanks for staying a bit past the hour, Paolo. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to jump in. But otherwise I'll go ahead and first end the live stream. So to everyone, with us on Can YouTube, we're watching question? this later. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, yes, sorry. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. I probably I missed the first part of the talk, so I'm sure. Did you try to did you do any inhibition studies where you actually uh, inhibit these waves? And if that happens, will the movement stop? I mean, are I mean, is it is it a pop? I mean, is apoptosis and this movement that you're showing? Is it somehow linked or these are completely two different phenomena that are happening? Uh, I mean, if you move, I'm just trying to understand if, if you somehow inhibit any of these or try to decrease the, um, you know, the propagation or even the generation of the waves, what happens to the cells? Do the cells lose their migratory phenotype? Will they stop migrating? Uh, actually, our, our data, that when, that when we inhibit the wave, uh, cells are still able to close the gap due to extrusion. Because um, uh, part of the cells that undergo apoptosis in uh, this cellular model undergo extrusion. So they are expelled from the epithelium and then the enable cell close the gap. So what, what, when we inhib inhibited the activation of EGFR, ERK, AKT, uh, metalloproteases, the extrusion could still occur, right? Oh, so so they, they still move, yeah. they're still able to move. So it's not necessarily- They're still able to, to close this small gap. It's a tiny gap, right? That is formed by the, the previous uh, uh, cells that die by apoptosis. So for sure they're, they're able to do that because we, we could see it. And then and, and the wave is completely abrogated. So at least this wave that we see is not essential for extrusion in our model. Okay. In other models, it, it can be, so. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, as I was saying, uh, unless anyone else wants to jump in again, um, thanks so much uh, for everyone who's here and for everyone who's gonna be watching this later. And uh, we will see you next week. What is this from Yutaka? Okay. Um. <laughs>
<laughs> Y'all just don't want to leave. Okay. Um, yes. I, what I'm going to do is I'll copy the chat and I will send that to the speakers so that they have that all for reference. Um, 